Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Richmond Public Library. The Richmond Public Law Library is sponsoring this um, book club. It's the Oliver W. Hill Book Club. And uh, this is our second meeting. So uh, we're feeling our way. And uh, this month, we are discussing The Organ Thieves by Chip Jones. And uh, Chip is here. And uh, let's get a little audience participation. Raise your hand if you're, you're a friend of Chip's. <laughs> All right, very good. Thank you, friends. <laughs> yes, thank you, friends. Um, so brother. also a fan. Okay. Oh, oh. <laughs> that's good. Friend and fan. That's that's great. Um, so we we're, we're going to be talking about the book. And how many of you have actually read the book? Oh, good. Wonderful. Okay, so um, we're going to be asking Chip some questions because Chip is here with us and um, he is going to give us a, a brief uh, introduction to the book and um, then we'll open it up to discussion. So Kathy has some questions for us to discuss and uh, if we can't answer them, we'll get Chip to answer them. He's, he's an expert on this book because he wrote it. Uh, so Chip, um, why don't you take it away? Right. Oh, I, I should introduce you. Okay, so Chip Jones um, has been reporting for nearly 30 years for the Richmond Times Dispatch, the Roanoke Times, Virginia Business Magazine, and others. He has written three books of military history, including Boys of 67, From Vietnam to Iraq, the Extraordinary Story of a Few Good Men and War Shots, Norm Hatch and the U.S. Marine Corps Combat Cameramen of World War II. So at, at this point, we're going to um, ask Chip if he would introduce us to his most recent book, The Organ Thieves, uh, the shocking story of the first heart transplant in the segregated South. Okay, Chip, take it away. Hey, well, hi, everybody. It really is wonderful to see um, so many familiar faces and some new ones, too. And I'd like to start by thanking our hosts, uh, Meldon Jenkins Jones and Catherine Coker of the Richmond Law Library. Um, I'm honored to speak to their new book club and to be told that um, I'm only the second author to speak uh, at the uh, club that was named for the civil rights and legal giant, Oliver W. Hill. As you might know, uh, Mr. Hill, along with his law partner in Richmond, Spotswood W. Robinson III, were part of the legal team that first represented the, the brave uh, African-American students uh, in Farmville, Virginia, uh, who walked out of their leaky, poorly heated high school in 1951 and how that led to their historic victory in 1954 uh, when Mr. Hill and his legal team went before the US Supreme Court in the case that became Brown versus Board of Education, which led to the end of the racist doctrine of separate but equal in public schools. Um, what some of you might not know, um, and which relates to some of the uh, history of Richmond and Virginia politics, you'll find in the Organ Thieves is that six years before winning that landmark decision uh, in 1948, Oliver Hill won a seat on what was then an all white city council in Richmond, uh, giving him the distinction of being the first African American elected to the city council uh, in Richmond since the days of reconstruction. Uh, after the Civil War. So it, it seems fitting to me uh, that the memory of Mr. Hill, who I believe died at the age of 100, uh, it's an amazing thing to think about in itself, in two, I think 2007, if I'm not mistaken, that, that, that his memory would help spark uh, this continuing program at Richmond's Public Law Library. Uh, and a, a, 
because it's a dialogue whose importance obviously is underscored uh, just every day, but certainly by the recent events uh, from Minnesota to North Carolina and not far from Richmond, where we are uh, down in the small town of Windsor, Virginia. So before we start having a di dialogue, and that really is what this is all about, um, I'll make a few remarks about uh, what I've come to think of as both a work of American history, but as well as my own personal journey, um, both before it and, and since the completion of the book and the release last August. Uh, and it's really a journey that continues tonight here with all of you. So welcome to my journey. <laughs> and, uh, and thank you for being part of it. I mean that sincerely. My research began roughly five years ago in 2016. Uh, when I first heard about what was considered a major medical triumph and, and victory uh, for, for Richmond uh, in particular, and more generally, the entire state of Virginia. And that was uh, the first heart transplant uh, performed in 1968. That was then the Medical College of Virginia. Today, it's called the uh, Virginia Commonwealth University Health System, or known as VCU Health. And I, I first learned about this once famous operation after leaving my job as a uh, business reporter at the Richmond Times Dispatch and eventually starting a second career uh, as the communications director of a large uh, local uh, medical society uh, called the Richmond Academy of Medicine, which dates back to, eight, to 1820. And it has extensive uh, historical archives and interviews and oral histories uh, and there's an, a number of writers in the audience here, and, and you all know, uh, and, a, and a lot of readers, and all of you know that archives are, are, are where a lot of great stories begin, or you, or you might discover them, a lot of hidden treasures, so to speak. And that's how I started reading uh, about uh, M Medical College of Virginia and its first transplant surgeons. Now, back in the 1960s, heart transplants, uh, to use one of Joe Biden's uh, pet phrases, uh, they were a really big deal. Uh, if you've already read my book, uh, you'll recall that the first such operation had been performed in late 1967, or about six months before the events that I uh, focus on at MCV. And what stood out to me at the time when I was doing my early research was a contra controversial figure that I remembered from my own high school days, uh, Dr. Christian Bernard. And Dr. Bernard was the South African surgeon uh, who became an overnight celebrity when he conducted the first ever successful heart transplant in late 1967. It was the medical equivalent of landing the first man on the moon or, or breaking the sound barrier. Uh, only it was done in the uh, relative obscurity of a hospital in Cape Town, South Africa, in what was still an apartheid nation. So from the start, the history of heart transplants had a racial component as uh, Dr. Bernard decided to wait for a white heart donor for an ailing white patient. This would change very soon after that though. But my initial interest was further piqued by something else I hit upon in, in, in my early research, this, this trailblazing surgeon, Dr. Bernard, he had learned some of his most important techniques right here in Richmond at MCV, only about a year before he achieved his, his famous breakthrough. And in 1967, Christian Bernard spent three months in downtown Richmond at MCV as a visiting surgeon. And there was something else that made me keep digging deeper into the story. Right after the MCV heart transplant in May, 1968, the family of the man who had given up his heart, a black factory worker named Bruce Tucker, contacted a young criminal defense lawyer named L. Douglas Wilder. They wanted to find out why Mr. Tucker's brother, a store owner and shoe repairman named William, who worked about a mile away from the hospital, why he hadn't been informed by MCV officials of Bruce's deadly 
state. Now, as those of you who, who read my, my book already know, that job would fall to a rural funeral home director who made the shocking discovery of the missing heart and missing kidneys as well while preparing Bruce Tucker's body for burial. When people have asked me what this book is about, I usually walk them through this process I've been describing to you. In, in other words, my initial interest was, it was sort of like The Right Stuff by Tom Wolfe about the space race meets, meets uh, the medical world. And it started out, my initial interest, as I said, going through the archives locally, was the story of two star surgeons, very accomplished physicians, Richard Lauer and David Hume, and their part in the international heart transplant race. But when I learned what had happened to Bruce Tucker, which first in an interview with former Governor Wilder in 2017, the trajectory of my thinking changed along with the heart and soul of my book. It remained a medical story, but became something bigger. I wanted to shed light on the indignities and injustices inflicted on Bruce Tucker and William Tucker and the rest of his family. While Bev Orndorff of the Times-Dispatch, one of my former colleagues and others did a great reporting job decades ago, as did scholars I quote in the book who still call this a case study in how not to handle an organ transplant. I wanted to capture the entire story in a new way for a new generation of readers. And I also wanted to tie in something else that I learned in my research. And that is how racism poisoned the wells figuratively and literally of our nation's early medical and healthcare system. I also explore how the legal system was stacked against the Tucker family as it later sought financial compensation for their loss. So in closing of my remarks, when I describe this journey, I mean that in several ways. You'll see the, in my book, the journey down to the countryside of Dinwiddie County, the rural areas, outside of Petersburg, Virginia, where members of the Tucker family still live. And you'll journey inside the operating rooms at MCV and elsewhere around the country, like at Stanford, where a lot of Dr. Lowry's research was done, early research. But you also join me in my journey back in time to the strange and often brutal activities that took place, often in the dead of night, along this one square block in Richmond, Virginia, along 12th and Marshall Streets within, you know, spitting distance of the Virginia Capitol, where the Egyptian building still stands and where many more bodies remain buried beneath the entrance of the modern day VCU School of Medicine. I'll leave you with this. Since we often read history to draw lessons for the present day. What lessons have you drawn from my book and what surprised you the most? What lessons have you drawn from my book and what might have surprised you? I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. And secondly, what do you think are the most pressing and unresolved questions raised by the organ thieves? Thank you for listening. Those are my remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Chip. That was a great introduction to the book. Thank and um, Kathy, I'll, I'll um, ask you to start the questions or the discussion. Does anyone have a, um, a question that they would like to ask Chip? Or do you have a question that uh, you want the group to discuss? Um, and if you're totally shy and don't want to speak up, you can put your question in the chat. Um, but uh, you're welcome to unmute yourself and just um, chime in. <laughs> oh, I see a hand. Um, yes. Um, Hi, this is Robin Jones. And you may feel you've covered this, Mr. Jones, but 
how is it that this story is not more widely known? Um, thank goodness for your journalism and your scholarship, but mm -hmm. was it was it just the times and these were just things that happened and the public really didn't have any need to know or or what? Wow, that's such a good question. Thank you. Yeah, um, I guess I may. Um, I think it's because they were doing this dirty stuff all along. And it, it just that's part of the industry. That's what I think. Tip, what do you think? Interesting. Um, so Robin, I would say that there, there often are, so we were talking before we started, sort of, you know, uh, forgotten history stories out, out in the world. Um, if you think you think about Henrietta Lacks in the early '50s at Johns Hopkins, and uh, taking her cervical cell, uh, her cervical uh, cancer cells, uh, and how that um, super work by uh, Rebecca Sklute, I think, who wrote *The Immortal Life*, that that's a that would be a, a, an example of a sort of a, uh, a an, an old uh, sort of hidden bit of history that when someone such as myself, uh, if you're fortunate enough to start looking into it and put it, putting some pieces together, um, that's, in, to me, um, that's what forms the basis of um, what's known generally as investigative journalism. Um, we, ha we have an investigative journalist on with us if she decides to jump in, but um, that would be the other part of the answer to me is that, uh, I'll, give you, I'll give you another analogy. Um, back in the, <clears throat> about 1994, there was a lot of things about the tobacco industry that started to come out. And I happened to have the good fortune of being here in Richmond in the, what I call the, the uh, epicenter of the tobacco industry. Now, all of those things were there about Philip Morris spiking in cigarettes to addict young smokers. And even today, there's new, there's new research about using menthol to to keep uh, black smokers involved and the cool cigarettes and all that stuff. Well, those were, those were things that were right under the nose of, of, of writers until a guy named Walt Bogdaditch, I think it was his name, uh, did the uh, big expose for ABC uh, uh, at the time. And the, 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 it led to um, all of the reforms and laws that were passed and the $10 billion settlement. So long-winded answer to your question, but. That's an example to me of what investigative journalism is. Um, at the time, the last thing I'll say is at the time in 68, um, it was a headline story. And then in 72, it, it was like a seven day trial. And there were at least in the state and the Washington Post had stories. The New York Times had some wire stories, uh, but it just faded from memory. And as, as Melvin said too, there were a lot of other, uh, it fits into uh, a, a spectrum of, of stories that were similar, but at the time it, it, was, it was the first wrongful death lawsuit ever brought uh, in, in, a, in a heart transplant case when it finally came to trial. So I hope that answers your question a bit. Well, I've read, I've read Sploot's work and I followed uh, the Gila cell story, and frankly, didn't didn't know about it. I mean, I'm not a scientist, and now that you know the investigative journalists have brought it to my attention that oh yeah, maybe you can't just take take stuff from people. That certainly is a case, but taking somebody's organs seems like a just a a real extreme of that kind of entitlement that the establishment had. I mean, it, it's almost not in the same ballpark. Mm, okay, good point. Uh, Chip, Bruce Bernie here from Charleston. Do you hear me? Hi, Bruce. How are you? Good. Uh, a couple things that I thought about, you know, I think I, I, if no one else knows, I was an OBGYN resident in 1971, working at St. Philip's Hospital. And I was a very young, uh, relatively naive young soul from mm -hmm. Ohio. 
And my sense is you had a, a, a conversion of two worlds, which was a medical environment where there was no uh, uh, research oriented uh, process to accomplish things. In other words, things were done on the fly and there was no review programs at that time. Hmm. And you had uh, basically, as what I call cowboys out there, uh, uh, doing what they thought was right, but without uh, uh, institutional review. And then on top of that, you had an environment of uh, St. Philip's Hospital and West Hospital, which was uh, in our world would be considered a very racist kind of approach to indigent health care, particularly poor African-American women where I worked mm. and, and the world that Richmond, Virginia was in at that time. Mm. And then you had these two worlds come together in what appears to be a, a very disturbing story, which it was, but mm. it was the mark of the times. Not that that made it an excuse, but right. I think you had two colliding worlds medicine that was out of control or not really looked upon and also the the uh the uh, uh the taking care of the poor public sector particularly african-american and how they were treated differently there was no question very interesting i'll get myself on mute here i liked how you laid out in the first few chapters uh uh as Bruce was talking about, uh, this was nothing new from what you were saying and what I already supposed that this indignities shown toward uh, African-Americans and poor uh, white people and other probably minorities in the medical community, mm -hmm. uh, community. And then we still see that today. Mm -hmm. uh, minorities are not, uh, given the same uh, equal treatment in medical in the medical world. Mm -hmm. So I think I, you really did a great job, I thought, in laying the groundwork leading up to 1968 and that this uh, attitude and uh, toward uh, treating African-Americans and the white privilege mm -hmm. laid the groundwork for 68. And that was not that attitude was nothing new. Yeah, the, um, it's interesting. I was thinking when you were, were mentioning the grave robbing uh, that went on. And as I, I point out in the book, the earliest grave robbing was at Harvard uh, and it was also at Columbia uh, and uh, most of the major hospitals, not to, not to justify it. Uh, in fact, one of the things I learned, and this is written for a popular reading audience, these were things that some academics might have known, but when I read them, they just completely freaked me out. I could not believe it. Um, there were riots by free blacks in New York City, in Philadelphia, uh, all across the country when they saw that their loved ones' bodies were being stolen and chopped up in, to have the first uh, medical uh, dissection classes in America. And so for me, the way I present this as a writer is that um, all this stuff is totally shocking. Um, and, but also uh, one of the things I learned early on was that except for dissection classes, that was the only hands-on work that doctors did like at MCV or at any of these places. The rest of it was book learning. So that's why when I saw the archival letters uh, from the for the found Augustus Warner, and he used all this racially coded language, you know, about our peculiar institution. They, they would, that's what a lot of this book is also about language, you know, and about uh, how, and it still happens today, you know. And, and that, that's why I would invite everyone when you when you hear reporting about, you know, the quote black community or how, you know. COVID uh, vaccines are, are being administered or not. It's just interesting to see how things are phrased. Even today, I, I always think that there's always something we're doing now that's probably just as bad as what we did 50 years, what we, I say we as a privileged white person, but the white establishment did 50 years ago. Um, but one of the interesting things that's more re uh, redemptive to think about is, um, and, and then I've met, there's a, an activist named Lenora McQueen, who's an, actually an artist in um, San Antonio, Texas. 
and she's been real active. Uh, and she would be a great speaker for you, uh, Melden, because she is a ball of fire and she figured out uh, through her own research that her, I think it's her fifth great grand, it's a great, 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 great grandmother uh, had been her bot. She had worked around Thomas Jefferson's plantations and all that stuff in Charlottesville. And she traced her grandmother actually wound up in the African burial yard that I write about in, in the book. And this is why I say it's a journey for me because she contacted me and she's still trying to get the city of Richmond, which they just approved like two acres. They, it's still it's still happening. They, they, they're going to protect that bit. But she's saying, no, no, no. All of these bodies, including my great, great grandmother, are under that area by I-64 at Fifth Street. That's where it is. And, she, and she write, she's been writing Governor McCall and she's very uh, She's, she's got letters of accreditation from all kinds of historians. Um, but what blew my mind was she knew exactly where this lo her loved one was buried. And also she discovered a poem that had been written in Harper's Weekly about her great grandma, about, uh, about a, um, I, and I was telling a friend of my friends, the Morrisons about this. It was a, uh, a Baptist uh, uh, event uh, or, you know, kind of a memorial by the gravesite. And it was about her great great grandmother. It was in Harper's Weekly. So she she herself, when we talk about how do you find stories, you find stories just by digging. I mean, I mean that in the figurative sense. With this story, there's a lot of actual digging that's gone on. But there's just still, I guess the point is so much unresolved and unsettled and unsettling history, you know, because I mean, I, I've been around and talking about, you know, bodies and things, and I don't mean to sound insensitive, because when I first started looking at this stuff and reading some of these accounts, I, I mean, it made me sick. And so I, I hope my book didn't make you sick. I tried to present it as, you know, as except where it, it, it should make anyone sick. I mean, what happened to Tucker and what happened to, and, and all those early, and the bodies are still under the they still don't know what to do on, under the uh, entrance there to the Contos building. There's a descendant community group here which is doing great work at VCU. But as you know, if you read the chapter about what, finding those bodies in 1994, they, they, they were, it was ordered uh, to be reinterred. <laughs> so it's a, it's, a, it's a continuing story. I, I see a hand. Yeah. Is it, are you looking at mine? That's That's one right. of them. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, yeah, Bob Morrison. Uh, I've, um, you know, when I first read the book, it was uh, it it was exciting to me because it was not too long after the new sculpture had come to the, where the Virginia Museum is. I mean, the fine arts Kahani and, and also the hmm? the Kahani Wiley. Yes, yes, that and then um, uh, the there was uh, the, the the statues were cut kind of, soon after that the 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 old civil war hero quote unquote statues were coming down a lot of exciting things happened in richmond and then the black lives matter uh, movement and people saying say his name and of course here was bruce tucker's name as needs to be said and then they they as you just mentioned the uh, you know, what's, uh, it was fairly, I mean, I don't know that anybody, some of the other things had been reported before and then gone out of, you know, current events, but right. this was a new thing, I think, uh, at least I had never heard of it. It was a lot of, uh, it seemed to me a real good time for VCU to say, you yeah. know, this is a movement in Richmond that's exciting and forward looking that we start to, to address some of these. And right about that time, a, um, one of the surgeons, the head of the radiology department, which I've gotten great radiology treatment at, 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 at BCU, I'm, I'm just, I I'm, would give them you know, greatest marks. But he came and said, you know, we have to practice medicine differently and we have to be in the community saying about things that, that weren't done right so that people will trust us. And there was the, a head of a department, I think it was, talking mm -hmm. like that. But then VCU as a whole did not pick up on that. 
and pick up on your story and put those two things together and, and do uh, uh, things. And I don't see your former employer, the Richmond Times Dispatch, making, you know, kind of holding up uh, any kind of uh, flashlight on this. I mean, I, I, to, I know in your book you talk about they, they really didn't want to be too critical of, of uh, MCV, and mm. I don't think they want to be too critical of ECU now. They don't want to be, but just so critical, they could just say, Lisa, you, you've got a, a wonderful opportunity to do this, but I don't see that happening. I, I, I don't know what my question is, except how could it happen? Um, what would it take? Well, that's a great question. <laughs> um, he said, sighing. <laughs> um, I would say this, uh, and there's some things I, I can't really talk about because I'm, I'm very hopeful that, I will say this, that institutions move very slowly. Um, and certainly that's a very large institution. Um, I, I, I have heard from people inside the VCU and, and people who helped me with the book, that's, you know, Mark Ryan and Jody Cossey, they're all in the acknowledgements. I mean, the staff there can, is amazing. Um, but in terms of the, the, the leadership uh, deciding to do something, what would that look like? Okay, so my point of view has always been trying to let the Tucker family say what that would be like. What would that look like for them? Because I don't wanna be the guy especially the white guy saying what should happen to, is it an apology? Is it naming a wing after him? Is it scholarships? I always thought giving scholarships to students uh, from, from Dinwiddie named for Bruce Tucker or Bruce and William, or is it some, is it, um, you know, reparations? Now you and I, everyone sitting here knows, if you talk about money, that's where, that's where the uh, that's where the lawyers get called in, whether or not that's happening or not. I don't know, and I think there's some good people, people of goodwill, at, at VCU that I've talked to about that. I see Miranda Spivak. Hi. Um, so my question is: now that you're mentioning all of this about VCU and its potential role. This is a public university that's publicly funded by your tax dollars. And I'm no longer a Virginia resident, but I was. <laughs> um, you know, has this gotten to the level of the governor or the people running for governor or the attorney general or anything like that? That's a really great, I, I, I'm not aware of that. I did share it with uh, Governor uh, Northam's uh, secretary of education was, was very, very, you know, he was very positive about it, but I haven't, uh, I have, I have talked to a few legislators off the record about trying to make something happen. And I'm still waiting to, to see something happen on, on that level. But I like what you said, uh, Miranda, about being tax supported. Uh, and you are an expert in the, in FOIA uh, free of information requests. So if anyone has the time, um, I've been tied up doing other things related to the book, but um, it would be uh, it would be interesting to, to do any any kind of uh, free of information work around this. And, and you know, honestly, what really gets me about our and pardon me for getting on the soapbox about tax dollars a little bit, but. Um, the university, all of the publicly funded universities spend so much money on advertising and marketing. And Bob mentioned the Times Dispatch. You know, obviously, uh, legacy media is, is so dialed down now and they have so few reporters. And every time I see a new billboard or an ad for VCU Health, I always think, I wish I was really a daily reporter again, because that's really where you should dig into to see you know, like for example, all these places run ads about the emer the uh, quick times in the emergency room. Well, you're not supposed to do health in the emergency room. So why are they advertising how quick their emergency rooms are if that's what the cost of them? So, you know, these, but to answer your question, no, it hasn't gotten to the governor. I hope it does. I hope someone listening here will, you know, kick it up to them. <laughs> 
Uh, Chip? Yes. Have you uh, got, uh, received, have you gotten any backlash about the book? Um, any backlash I can talk about on a public Zoom meeting. Um, <laughs> let's see. I'm a person in my household who advises me is making a, a finger, not a finger, finger, but a finger indicator to me. Um, I would say there hasn't been a whole lot of um, public negative backlash. Um, the only thing that's happened publicly, as, as you might know, is before the book came out, the um, MCV Foundation, which is the fundraising arm for the hospital, they put a disclaimer on their story about their vaunted uh, you know, operation, and they said they were sorry about not informing the Tucker family. And that's where I thought maybe something would happen. But beyond that, um, not, uh, nothing publicly. I have another question also, which is um, how competitive did the doctors feel in the late 60s? Uh, you know, Christian Barnard, the sort of guy who was, you know, the, the great leader on all of this had been at their hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Richmond is a uh, city mm -hmm. always, I think, looking to put itself on the map in some way. You know, mm -hmm. was that a factor in all of this, do you think? It was, yeah. And I, I, I found that out uh, through oral, you know, uh, history uh, interviews with Dr. Lauer and talking to some of his contem uh, contemporaries, actually. It definitely was. Um, and but Dr. Hume was the driving force. He was the he was the the id behind this uh, and in recruiting uh, Richard Lauer in 1965 to Richmond from Stanford, where he was with uh, Dr. Shumway. And um, as, as I write in the book, uh, it's, it was like, uh, it, the clock was ticking from the time that Lauer arrived in 65 to when he finally did it. And Dr. Lauer was, was just more cautious than Christian Bernard. And um, in his view, and as I, as I write about it in the book, you know, that Bernard really wasn't prepared to do the operation when he did it in South Africa because he hadn't done all of the um, uh, preparatory animal research that Lauer had done. So yes, I mean, it was, it, it was, uh, it was a matter of, of trying to put MCV on the map. And that's why he was brought here. And that's why, as I write about in the book, that uh, there was a huge disappointment when they lost the race. And then there was really more pressure. And um, I think that um, this is where I've always said that Bruce Tucker, uh, he, he was rolled into the emergency room at a very bad time for a very severely uh, head injured black man with uh, alcohol on him, which added to the um, stereotyping and racist um, treatment that he, he faced. Um, and, and as I quoted, um, uh, uh, Su I think Susan Letterer, who, uh, one of the academics that, who wrote about this, you know, he was viewed as, as what was termed at the time as, as socially dead. Um, and again, there's some strong language, you know, and think about in today's world, you know, who is socially dead that, that and, and then the treatment uh, in, in, uh, in the world. And obviously the case of George Floyd comes screaming out to me. Uh, and, uh, and then, you know, we've had these, this continuing cases of police brutality um, towards black men and women, I mean, every day. So it, but it was pressure. It was pressure, it was professional pressure. And as, as we all know, um, you know, you, you got to have a big ego to be a surgeon in the first place. Um, and so these are, you know, if you're going to cut into somebody and, and study and, 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 and doing, doing good work, you know, you got to be a pretty type AAA person as it is. And, and most of them are great. And, uh, 
I'm not going to get into uh, the personalities of each one of these surgeons because they, you know, I, I received a little bit of criticism for not being uh, harder on them in my book, uh, but I tried to present what I saw as the facts of the story uh, and how they themselves walked into kind of a historical uh, situation uh, where they made certain decisions. <laughs> Which, which maybe, um, which maybe they regret. That's not my dog. Sorry about my dog, uh, Bruce. Again, hey Bruce. Uh, a couple things. First of all, uh, David Hume was a huge ego. I mean, and a phenomenal surgeon. He really could do anything, and he told you that. Uh, I'm not so sure that that uh, Bruce Tucker, being African American would have been any different if he were white in the same circumstances. I think that the, the point in your book that I learned was, uh, I think the story of the African-American poverty stricken community was really the issue. In other words, the women coming through St. Philip's Hospital were predominantly African-American and were treated as such in a separate institution where you couldn't even get surgery done you had to be taken through the steam tunnels to get to mcv west if you had to have an emergency uh, c-section uh, the the uh, the uh surgeon ego is predominant throughout the country still is sure, so sure. i don't think that the the african-american piece and again you may disagree was the issue i don't think that the the african-american piece and again you may disagree was the issue with bruce tucker it was the opportunity and he took it. that was my sense Thank you. Sorry about the dog. <laughs> there's there's a, a person waving his hand who, who looks familiar. Oh, that's my brother, Bill. Brother Bill, I've got a comment from the, uh, the previous. Uh, I'm the older brother of uh, the author, about <laughs> six years older. And in 1963, I've told Chip this a million times. In 1963, the summer of 63, uh, I was picking uh, tomatoes and uh, corn and toting uh, watermelon <laughs> in uh, Colonial Beach, Virginia. And as Chip mentioned, being white privilege, our father was a, a one-star general at the time in Northern Virginia. So in Colonial Beach, Virginia, 69 miles northeast of Richmond, it was like going back to the 19th century Mm. Jim Crow, it was totally segregated. Mm. And, and I saw how the uh, blacks who were all picking, except for me, 16-year-old <laughs> white kid, uh, they were literally treated mm. as though it was the 1800s. Mm. And, I, and I saw from Chip's book, which I read, and I've passed it on to my grandchildren. I've got some older grandchildren, teenagers in North Carolina to read it about how I can see how Bruce Tucker was a second class citizen in Richmond, Virginia. He goes in uh, in a gurney and because he's black, poor, has alcohol on his breath mm. and uh, no ID, even though his brother's business cards in his pocket, in the pocket of this, this injured person, Point. The the uh, MCV just treated him. Oh, here's a good. He's not a cadaver yet, but he's almost a cadaver. Let's start cutting. That's what I got from the book. Mm. And, and what I was hoping is that more people in the metropolitan Richmond area and the state of Virginia would read this in the Black Lives Matter era and today and go, geez, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Let's let's get on board. So that's my comment. And I enjoyed the book too. Thanks, Bill. <laughs> I thought you were gonna say, Bill, that that they saw this, this black man on the gurney as, as just a commodity, hmm. which I think they saw him as a commodity. And I could, of course, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm wounded and, um, maybe not so shocked about this story mm. you know i'm kind of cynical in my in my living mm. but my issue is that i don't 
think there's a huge, huge stretch on things that go on today. Hmm. I hear stories from young friends who work at the medical college hmm. about stories about, oh, Black people don't feel the same pain. Ooh. Black people don't, oh no, we're not gonna do that. They're just, and so my, my point is that I'm worried that we're, yes, making progress, thank goodness, but I think we got some work to do still. And part of it is, is tough. Part of these lessons are tough to learn, but I think um, Chris Chip has done a good job with telling a terrible story and making it readable. Thank you. But, you know, we got, we got, a, we got a ways to go, I think. Absolutely. Well, thank, thank you for that. Yeah, and, and I'll just tag on that, uh, Robin. Um, that's a really good point. Um, the implicit biases that are still with us. Um, and I think that, again, I, I, I'm kind of caught in a weird position as far as talking about VCU because they're not talking to me directly. I just, people share things, uh, for example, that, the, that's that the, the new leadership of the uh, of VCU Health has started some kind of um, uh, medicine and history program. They haven't called me up about it, but somebody who works there said I, that my book was on the list and that she get credit for reading it. Um, I said, great. <laughs> um, so, um, but, but I, I, know, I know that um, there are people of goodwill that are addressing these these just persistent racist stereotypes, like you said, Robin, about pain. Um, and, um, um, and, and, and just the whole, you know, implicit bias uh, that are built into, to a lot of us, I know built into me, like. Yeah, it's not just MCV and it's not just the medical profession. Exactly. It's, it's all of us. Exactly. And, and, I and I'll just add one more thing from the discussions like this. And I really do appreciate all of you guys being here and sharing your thoughts because I've heard, uh, and that's why I talk about being a journey. I have heard from people from New York, Los Angeles, all kinds of, and some of them are kind of strange radio talk show things I've been on um, that, you know, it put me on the spot as a white guy writing about things that hurt black people. Um, but that's a good thing to have that discussion. And the one thing I've learned is there is still so much suspicion. I mean, not just and about and about Oregon. And I get put on the spot about this. I say, all I know about is what I wrote about in this book. <laughs> I don't know what happened in the Philippines last year. I don't know about that or the, and, and, but I'm not trying to pour water on it, um, but I do hope that people, uh, other journalists, other writers keep digging into the, uh, the issues around, when you look at with COVID and the, the, la the lack of, um, you know, initially of treating people in black communities and also, you know, Latinx communities and the, the, uh, the, the uh, you know, vaccine hesitancy that's still there, there's a huge public health problem because of what we've been talking about, you know, fear, suspicion, and lack of feeling like, you know, we're, we're represented. Right, distrust. One last, th uh, the book, actually I was interviewed, it's on my website, if you ever want to, it's chipjonesbooks.com, the interview with um, NBC in Chicago, it's called, A Race in Chicago was called, and I was shocked that there's only, uh, they're working with a Northwestern transplant surgeon and she's one of only 16 black uh, transplant surgeons in the country. Again, what year is this? So. John? To just give you, you said, you know, what you found striking about the book and what I found most striking um, is that, you know, I've worked for some uh, companies, including some very large local employers. And it was the idea of the regulations that were in place back then, which were almost nil. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you from working for some of these companies, 
that basically the approach is there's no such thing as self-regulation. They'll take a look at the, you know, the law and says, we're planning to do this. Is this illegal? Huh. And unless it's illegal and something specifically says, no, you can't do this, right. we're going to do it as long as it is beneficial to us wow. and makes us money. So, you know, the self-regulation thing and, you know, what's going to be moral, immoral, right, wrong, what doesn't really play into large institutions. They're going to do what they're going to do that's going to be to their maximum benefit. And that's, that's the way it is today. That's the way it's been in the past. And it was just, yeah, it was the way it was back then. They thought they could get away with it because the larger you are, the more right you are. And they had the money right. and uh, the, the attorneys to, to back right. them up. Right. And that, that, that fits, John, what uh, Doug Wilder told me initially in our first interview that, that, he, that he knew that um, he was going up against the attorney general's office because it was, an, it was a, such a big deal for the state uh, mm -hmm. in general, that it was like too big to lose as a case. Right. And that really jumped out at me because it reminded me of what they say about banks, too big to fail. Mm -hmm. This case is too big for them to lose. And, and it, that fits what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Follow the money, right? Exactly. <laughs> the money will take you to the, to the truth. Absolutely. I have a question about um, the life support, um, where, where on the scheme of things does this particular case fit, Chip, uh, on the, the um, I don't know, even know what they call it, but the determination of when someone is dead. Oh, brain death? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, this was a, 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 a very early, um, Kind of seminal case uh, in medical law uh, in determining um, um, when a human, I, I don't want to use technical jargon, you know, it's just basically when, when are we actually alive or dead? And uh, amazingly, uh, I found uh, in my research that at the time of uh, the Tucker transplant and its removal of his heart, there was no brain death um, allowed or, or considered in the code of Virginia and in most state codes. And these are state laws. Um, uh, so, but the, the, the twist to it, what I found out too, was that Harvard had an ad hoc commission on brain death that, that Do Dr. Hume was aware of and Dr. Lauer. And in the minds of the, of the advanced surgeons, uh, at MCV, this was a case where the, the law had not caught up with the science. Um, so by the time it came to trial in 72, and if you read the book, you'll see how Dr. Hume uh, magically and, and quite creatively figured out a way to hold an international uh, uh, conference in Richmond at the same time of the trial and got all these experts uh, from Harvard and Yale and UVA. And uh, they basically convinced the judge uh, to allow in um, the concept of brain death. And that turned, that turned the, 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 the trial. And that was why Doug Wilder was still really bitter about that because he really felt like, uh, you know, essentially they really pulled a fast one and, and got a favorable verdict. And, um, uh, so it, what happened was, uh, and again, this is kind of paradoxical that Doug Wilder worked with Dr. Hume next year, within six months, the Code of Virginia was amended and uh, allowed the, the uh, brain death as a cause of death and, and to, allow, uh, to allow physicians to declare someone uh, was, was, uh, had lost what we think of as, as functioning life because of the this, their, their, brain, their brain was, was so damaged. So um, it, it, it was definitely, um, Melon, to your question, right on the cutting edge. And it was only the second uh, law, brain death law in, 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 in the United States uh, at that time, Kansas, uh, where my brother and I both went to school at, 
little personal aside, I was amazed that Kansas was actually the first one. <laughs> so, uh, but then most states fell in line. And the judge in the case, uh, Christian Compton, became a member of the Virginia Supreme Court. He became a national speaker on this, what was then kind of uh, progressive uh, idea that, that physicians should be allowed to, to say that someone, you know, is, is can't be treated and any further, and that it would be better to let the family make that decision. But before that, 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 that couldn't, that couldn't happen. So I hope that answers your question. That answers my question. And the reason why I was concerned was because when I read about uh, Dr. Bernard's um, first um, breakthrough, mm -hmm. uh, he definitely made sure that the donor was dead. <laughs> I mean, he himself made sure she was dead before. Yes. Um, yeah, he definitely cut her open. Yeah. Had a lot of leeway in, the, in South Africa. Yeah, that's true. And, and I think the key thing about all this, um, and I've always said this, that you know, one can talk about clinically um, how long Bruce Tucker probably would have survived. But to me, what became increasingly apparent was that the family was never given the chance to make the decision. And along with that, wasn't able to say goodbye. Uh, and at the time, also, I should have said, at the time, in 1968, not only was not was brain death not part of the law, there was on the books the law to to you had to have a 24 hour waiting period, and that was ignored because basically Dr. Hume um, uh, kind of bullied this assistant medical examiner who was on duty uh, that weekend, and uh, said, you know, the heart's not going to be viable if we don't put it in right away, and 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 the examiner didn't stop him. Uh, and again, this is a medical story meets a legal story meets an ethical story meets a political story meets a social story. I mean, we just, uh, um, I, I, think, I think for me, when I talk to a broader audience and talking to younger people about it, I like to say, you know, that it, we, we should all know that at some point in our lives, we're going to be asked to do either the, what we know is the right thing or the wrong thing. And as a matter of ethics, I think it was really, really the wrong thing. And I know for a fact that the family and his son have suffered psychological trauma since then. And I can say on, on a more redemptive note that I was told by a family member that Abraham has actually uh, feels much more positive after reading the book because I wasn't trying to re-traumatize him by, by writing the book. And again, that's a journalistic question and, and it's not, as Miranda can tell you, it's not an easy one to answer. You're trying to bring out the truth, but you're not trying to do it at the expense of someone's me mental health or, or happiness. And so, I mean, in some ways, when you're a reporter, you're trained to uh, just get the facts. And, and that's how I started. But I, for my, my own journey, I started talking about the journey. One of the journeys for me was kind of moving from being maybe just a reporter to trying to be, you know, a, a, someone who was kind of considering the people's, people's feelings. Uh, and that's why I have a chapter about trying to talk to Abraham without putting him on tr any sort of trial. Um, and I'm just glad that he feels, um, he's learned that his father, as I, as I said to him, and as I sort of quote myself in, in that one chapter where I write from the first person, that his father deserved to be uh, honored for his donation. And, and his brother, uh, William, I think deserves to be honored for fighting the fight, just like those students that fought in Farmville, Barbara Johns and Oliver Hill, you know? I mean, they just fought these amazing fights and the fight's still going on. I mean, I don't have to tell you guys that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chip. Are there any other questions that anyone has uh, about the book or any comments that you would like to make about the book? Um, I think it's a very important book. And um, 
I think everyone should read it. And <laughs> yeah, we, we do what we can at the library, um, but we need to get more people to publicize these things because it, it affects people's thinking. It affects their understanding. And it's so important in this 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 fight. Everybody, uh, all battles are not won by um, marching. Absolutely, absolutely. It really is a, a battle of ideas. And how to get like what what John was saying? How to get the institution to embrace that, uh, even if it puts at risk some of our tax dollars. <laughs> that's that's I, I have to write a four I'll, I'll maybe end with this and let, if people don't have any more questions and I really appreciate your time and your attention I have to write a forward to the paperback edition which will come out next February and I have to write that by August I think you know because publishers work ahead and I'm really waiting to 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 have an you know something good something positive to say in the forward about what uh, the university does. Uh, so if anyone who's listening <laughs> has ever relations <laughs> to anyone at VCU, let them know. I'd love to, to uh, say they did the right thing. You know, um, if they haven't done it yet, I'll say that too. Um, and, but even if they do, it's still, you know, as as uh, as Robin was saying, th these kinds of pernicious stereotypes and lies about other people and their bodies and 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 how we look at them or think about them, that's that's always going to need to keep staying a, a very strong focus. And um, if I ever get to talk to any of the students at VCU, that's what I'll, I'll I would what I would suggest. Just keep looking at those stories because let's face it, that's our human condition. Beautiful. Yes, yes, yes. Well, thank you so much, Chip thank Jones. You. Thank, uh, thank you, so you each and every one who has come to join in thank this you. discussion. And uh, we'll be back in um, two months with another book and uh, we'll let you all know what it's gonna be when we decide. Um, let's make June, July. Kathy, do we have a book for July yet? Is mm -hmm. Kathy still here? Um, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, there you are. Unmute yourself, Kathy. Mm -hmm. Kathy, you're muted. Okay. Uh, okay. We okay. were thinking about the invisible. Ah, invisible. Yes. A story about uh, the first Black woman prosecutor. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, we thank you all. Um, we're doing Lunch and Learns on alternate months. So please go to our website and check out some of the awesome programs that are being run by the librarians at the Richmond Public Library. Uh, the website is rvalibrary.org. Mm -hmm. And um, we thank you so much for your time. Thank you, guys. Thank Good night, you, everybody. library. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I keep calling you Chris. I just want to thank you for not sensationalizing this thing. You could have sold a few more books if you had, but you just seem like such a gentleman, and I appreciate well, that. And well, see, see whether they can get us a little bit further along the path. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Good night, y'all. Yeah.